Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today, revolutionary art, lost art and the hunt for mini art. We look at Yosef Boyce, who would have turned 100 years old this week. Then, we look at a game of lost and found that's lasted five centuries. And an artist urges New Yorkers to hunt down his tiny paintings. Avant-garde artist Josef Beuys would have turned 100 years old this week. Beuys believed in the power of art as a tool that could influence and change both politics and society. Inspired by the Dadaists, he wanted to free art from the constriction of institutions. And with his performances, he sought ways to integrate art into everyday life. To realize this mission, Boys also joined the anti-art movement Fluxus. Joining me now is Philip Ursprung, who has recently published a biography called Josef Boys Art, Capital, Revolution. Hi there, lovely to have you with us today. I want to start with this. Obviously, Josef Boys was big in the day, but do you think, I mean, how important do you think he is today? I mean, was he... Was his art revolutionary enough to still be influential 100 years old? I think uh, he's still with us, uh, with the art today. Uh, he attempted to free art from the occupation with itself, to make it accessible, to make it something democratic, uh, to make it something that everybody could participate. And even if he didn't succeed in all his attempts, this is something which uh, continues to inspire many artists today and inspire also, I think, many people who uh, are interested in art and even those who perhaps have never heard about it. Okay, in what ways do you think he keeps inspiring artists today? I mean, he had many ideas, and many concepts. So please talk us through which were the most influential. So, for instance, uh, one of his ideas was that art and politics should not be separated realms, that everybody could participate in shaping society as if he or she were an artist. He said everybody is an artist. It doesn't mean that everybody has to be a perfect musician or sculptor, but that everybody can behave as if you would give yourself a commission, be responsible for your actions, and with that contribute to shaping and changing uh, society. Uh, this is something which um, perhaps even today uh, many of us would, would wish to do or have more opportunity to do. And in looking at this art, it functions a little bit like a, a mirror image from the past reflecting what happens today. Mm, is this what he called a social sculpture? Yes, he used the term social sculpture. Again, trying to uh, improve or change not only art, but also improve and change the way politics functions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Philip, you said that he didn't think that arts and politics should be differentiated from one another. But also this really brought the understanding that he could really, you know, as Josef Boys, the, you know, grand artist, he could really like change the world, change the understanding of democracy in Europe and etc. So in that sense, is it a bit old fashioned to look at politics through art that way? The utopia, the dream that everybody at any time has the potential at least to interfere uh, and, and to change, this uh, has been with us uh, perhaps also in the past since the French Revolution and continues to be uh, an inspiring model. Mm -hmm. And also, Philip, he has a very interesting story, obviously. When we think of Josef Boys, we have to think of his personal story as well, because he really was trying to come to terms with his involvement in the World War II uh, through his art. So tell us what happened to him and how he was influenced by that and whether you think his uh, you know, inclination towards making political art was due to the fact that he was trying to come to terms with this fact in his life. Yes, his role in the war uh, was an important part of his life. Uh, he was a volunteer uh, 
for the, the German army. He was uh, flying with a, a bomber uh, squadrons. So he was actively and, and volunteering involved. He supported uh, the case. No? After the war, uh, he reflected on this time and he also reflected on, on his role. He tried to create a kind of a myth in order, some say, uh, to make us forget his role, others say uh, to make it even more visible. A, a myth is not the same thing as reality. And for him, it was a way to deal with something uh, that was crucial, but deal with it in a, in a way which could be made productive also to prevent that a war would ever happen again. So this might explain his very long engagement in the peace movement, uh, fighting against uh, nuclear armament and eventually also becoming one of the founding members of the Green Party, where he was always part of the pacifist mm -hmm. uh, part. OK, the charisma and the you know, the personal myth surrounded, uh, you know, surrounding him that obviously is tied to the story that you just told us, sort of polarized his audience. And some still think that I think um, Boyce was probably one of the first, uh, you know, modern artists that c contributed to the white male genius artist myth that is sort of still criticized on a daily basis in the art world today. How influential was he in that sense, you think? Yes, this absolutely. Uh, he was, on the one hand, trying to make art more democratic. On the other hand, he was perpetuating the myth of the white male genius artist. No? He was, everything was tied to his name. Even when he created a student party, he didn't ask the students. So this is part of his heritage. And it's, uh, of course, a part which has to be critically reflected and dealt with. Uh, but it's not possible to reduce it only to that authority because it's also an artistic model that shows how art can work in an anti authorian way. There's this part of the internal contradictions of Boyce, making art that everybody should participate. On the other hand, many said, well, nobody understands your art. We cannot totally resolve that. And perhaps the fact that this tension remains uh, makes that uh, one is still interested in. The case is not closed yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, very quickly before we wrap up, I mean, um, do you think his art without the personal myth surrounding it would be, I don't know, less interesting, less valuable or perhaps less, you know, worthy to remember? Uh, he was a sculptor. Uh, so if we look at the artworks, uh, they are excellent uh, formal achievements also. It's still a pleasure to wander through the installation. It's still a pleasure to see how gravity, how shape, how contrasts are dealt with. But we cannot take away the titles. The titles are part of the meaning. And we cannot take away the figure, the persona of Boyce and even the reception, the stories that he told that others have told. So in a way, it is as if he had become a kind of a monument where many, he himself, but also those that look at his work have contributed. So it's almost impossible to take away and distinguish precisely between what is the persona, what is the artist, what is the role, what is the performance, what is the work, and what are the many stories, uh, pro and contra, told about it. Lovely. It was good to have you with us today. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Great pleasure. This painting has been lost and found over the centuries multiple times. It's been sold to various art collectors, survived two world wars and now must deal with a global pandemic. Nursen Atutar has more on this piece of art's incredible journey. This painting is called The Living Cross of Ferrara and it's done by the Italian master Sebastiano Flippi, otherwise known as Bastianino. He was a young boy in the 16th century when he left his hometown of Ferrara to work in Rome under Michelangelo. 
When Bastianino returned home, the local monastery commissioned the living cross. It stayed in Ferrara for centuries, until the monastery was dissolved. Then the painting travelled across Europe through a number of sales, until Humboldt University acquired the piece in 1912. That's when its journey gets a bit turbulent. This painting was most probably held in the Berliner Cathedral during the two world wars, and because of the difficult climate in there, it suffered. The Living Cross of Ferrara also underwent five damaging restoration attempts. It was then left to be forgotten in Humboldt University's archives until the mid-2010s. When it was rediscovered, it took years to undo the damage. Before we started the restoration, the painting was covered in a yellow varnish. There were large parts that had been painted over and covered parts of the original. And because it was stored in difficult situations, there were parts missing from the painting. Now we can fully see the crucifix, with symbols laden throughout the piece that depict Ferrara's socio-political situation of its time. Oh, and it's a massive three meters tall work. It's so big that when it was sent to be displayed at the Jamalda Gallery in Berlin, workers there were relieved when it was finally put on the wall. The original frame was lost. We have been all thrilled. We've been all thrilled and as you can imagine in these things you have measured everything, you know, hundreds of times. But then when you came, if I remember correctly, when you came here with the painting we thought, oh God, let's hope it, it, it fits, let's hope it fits, let's hope it's not too big. But then it was everything, everything wonderful. Well, not everything is wonderful. While the painting is now beautifully hanging on a museum wall, COVID-19 restrictions mean tourists aren't allowed to see it just yet. I guess after centuries of mishaps, the Living Cross of Ferrara is still an ill-fated masterpiece. Westerval loves creating miniature pictures of New York, but he doesn't sell them. Instead, he wants his followers to hunt them down. This is Steve Westerval's latest piece created in his Brooklyn workshop. It's one of his many tiny paintings that depict scenes from the borough. But each time one is completed, Wasterval hides them in random spots on the street. And that's when the game begins. Wasterval makes an announcement on social media, giving clues to his thousands of followers. Whoever acts fast enough wins. And Wasterval says that could be anyone. It's everybody. That's, I think, what makes it so fun. So there'll be kids, but it's also mostly adults. And it's, you know, people my age. And, I guess there's not the older people, but they're, they're all ages. Yeah, all ages look, and uh, and some of them like art, some of them like the neighborhood, some of them like treasure hunts, some of them like all three. Wasterval says his mini hunt started three years ago with the hopes that he'd develop a deeper connection with his neighborhood. And despite obstacles from the coronavirus, people have been really into the project. Once it was people were comfortable going outside, they really wanted to go outside badly. And so this was this way uh, to have something to do outside that you didn't have to go into any place, you didn't have to spend any money. And it was like a treat if you happen to live in the neighborhood. So if you don't own any art, just hang around Greenpoint, Brooklyn long enough. Because when it's game on, the mini hunt could land you a price from a big heart.
protests have been recently held against television channels that use racist tropes. And now a new Netflix series focusing on black Italians is seen as a step in the right direction. But will people watch it? Se vi chiedete cosa c'entrano i manga giapponesi con un ragazzo nero nato a Milano, la mia risposta è niente. Zero premiered last month as one of Italy's top 10 streaming shows. It follows a black pizza delivery man nicknamed Zero. When he's not handing out pies in the Milan suburb where he lives, he plays the role of superhero to his friends and the people in his neighborhood with the use of a very special power. In real life, the character played by Giuseppe Dave Seke offers himself up as a role model for black Italians. The 25-year-old leading actor says growing up, he never saw someone like himself on television. I had to look abroad, so I looked at many sitcoms and American TV series. But I was a bit disappointed. And in the world of today, even in Italy, there are a lot of second-generation blacks. And this community is pretty strong. And we're not represented in cinema. So to be part of a series with a black story is a huge victory for me. And Zero hasn't just given representation to black Italians on screen, it's also provided jobs to black screenwriters, directors, and even hairdressers on set. Change is very difficult in a country so tight to traditions, but I tell you, I'm convinced that through these things, writing novels, the possibility of making a series, that things can change. The creators of Zero hope the series will help the public be more accepting of a multicultural Italian state. But with fairly lackluster reviews so far, it's still unknown if the show's hero can change things for the better off screen as well as on. Mission Impossible's big screen debut is celebrating its 25th anniversary. The cinematic rebranding of the MI franchise had less in common with the TV series and more with the unique vision of its director. So let's open up the movie almanac and take a look at new Hollywood outlaw Brian De Palma. Good morning, Mr. Phelps. This is your mission. Should when you Mission Impossible accept. made its theatrical you debut 25 years ago, what surprised fans the most was the producer's choice of director. Ethan Hunt will be your point man. Until then, Brian De Palma wasn't a name linked with big franchises. To the contrary, his movies tended to be outside the mainstream. We're being ambushed. And to the frustration of the director, never reached the huge box office success that he had hoped for. What De Palma did have was a lifelong obsession with surveillance, multiple personas, and deceitful characters. One can see why the filmmaker chose a spy story to make his entry into the world of mega-budget filmmaking. The visual style of this franchise starter has its director's stamp all over it. De Palma redefined blockbuster film language at the time with his trademark split screens, point of view shots and long sequences. And the formula worked. Mission Impossible broke box office records. He's on his own. Yes, he says he pulled the girl out of the car. I would like you to forget about her. Before the action-packed MI, De Palma was mainly known as a thriller director. He considers himself a student of Alfred Hitchcock. A good number of themes used by the master of suspense are recycled in De Palma's work. That eerie sensation that you've seen a stranger before. His movie Obsession has the overtones of vertigo with its use of a doppelganger. Call it deja vu. This man calls it terror. Sisters features a similar type of split personality theme 
that was also present in Psycho. De Palma even uses certain camera techniques associated with Hitchcock, like the bird's eye view, but he uses them in a postmodernist manner. However, according to cinephile director John Landis, Hitchcock was not amused by De Palma's homage to his work and called it fromage after the French cheese. Now you're not supposed to cut the cake until you make a wish and blow out the candle. Despite being mostly known as a genre director, De Palma's films are also socially conscious. His high mom holds a mirror to politically charged avant-garde art and the civil rights movement of the 1970s. All the poor people in the world, no matter what color they are. I don't know what I'm talking about. This is nuts. We ain't supposed to be doing this. Everybody else is up for this! This is kidnapping, ain't it, Sarge? Be advised, you best just... His Casualties of War and Redacted are based on real-life atrocities by U.S. soldiers, which include rape and murder during the Vietnam and Iraq wars. Always. Military court-martials are notoriously lenient. My job, so was to kill communist aggressors, count the bodies. Even if these four guys get convicted, they're not going to do any real time. Hi, Rick Santoro. Hello, Hello Richard Ricky. Santoro. Ah, I'm Ricky! And I am the king! Look, I got business calls. Along with Francis Ford Coppola and Martin Scorsese, Brian De Palma was one of the key figures that ushered in the age of New Hollywood during the second half of the 20th century. Unlike his peers, De Palma's films often divided critics. Some exalted him as a stylistic auteur. Others called him out for excessive violence in his films. But while it's easy to argue that Coppola and Scorsese are much bigger name directors, Brian De Palma is the only one of the three who has a filmography with a multi-billion dollar franchise. And for a guy who always longed for major financial success, Mission Impossible became a mission accomplished. 720 on the hotel side. What are you looking for? The house wins. From jumping off helicopters to parkour and fist fights, the once male-dominated world of stunts is attracting an increasing number of women in France. From jumping off helicopters to parkour and fistfights, the male-dominated world of stunts is attracting an increasing number of women at a special school in France. Take it from 29-year-old student Valerianne Michelini. I'm a dancer and a show performer, so I'm used to thriving in a graceful and feminine world. And now I'm in quite the opposite. I'm quite masculine and like brawls. The campus Universe Cascade is a school for stunt doubles and performers in northern France that bills itself as the world's biggest at 12 acres. Now, nearly a third of the student body is made up of women. CUC director Lucas Dolphus. Around 30% of all students are women in each training period. For example, for this training, we have 80 students, among them 24 women. And each time we take in 14 newcomers in each training period, there are around seven each time. It's the spirit of diversity almost each time. It's good for the campus spirit, it's good for diversity, it's good for the job market. And it adds a touch of girly tenderness. Although the women do love brawls and they're very badass in any case. Professional training in the school takes two years. There are 10 training periods that encompass acrobatics, parkour, combat, drops, and stunt wires. Maureen Dahl, who is 24, once worked as a makeup artist in film productions, but she said she has always been eager to delve into the athletic aspect of stunts. Stunts take from a lot of other fields. Combat sport, drops, we have to be polyvalent, and there's also an artistic and athletic side to it. It's choreographed, it's calculated, it's technical, and so there's a lot of things to keep in mind, but it's really great. Graduates end up working in superhero and action films, as well as live shows and amusement parks. And with the film industry's growing appetite for female superheroes and more diverse stories across streaming platforms, there's a real need. CUC coach Malik Diouf. 
The women who come out of this school are so multi-talented, they don't even finish their training here because they are hired in firms. There was a female student who finished two training sessions and then left for Marvel. Another female student finished two sessions but then left to make a film with Luc Besson. There's such a small pool of options for stunt women that as soon as they have the slightest skills, they leave directly for work with the Americans, the English, or the rest of the world. They don't stay in France. That's a bonus and it shows that women can do it as well as guys or even better. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter accounts have more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Elif Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.